Welcome everyone to CEPR uh, for our final associates event of the 2016-17 academic year. Maybe we are saving the best uh, for last year. I'm so grateful that you're all here and we're very fortunate to have Eddie Lazier with us to talk about the current landscape of entrepreneurship, not just in the US, but around the world. Um, in addition to being a CEPR senior fellow, Eddie is the Davies Family Professor of Economics at Stanford's Graduate School of Business and the Morris Arnold and Nona Cox Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. But before uh, turning things over to Eddie, I'd like to take just a couple of minutes to recognize and congratulate Moritz Lennel, who is a PhD student in our economics department and is the winner of this year's Landau Prize. Uh, the award is for the best student written CEPR working paper and is also a tribute to Claire and Ralph Landau who care deeply about economic policy research. Ralph was a consulting professor of economics here at Stanford and co-directed a research program on technology and economic growth. He and Claire were uh, the ones responsible for the Landau Economics Building right next door to us. Um, and we're very proud this year to give the award bearing their name to Moritz, uh, who will be getting his PhD later this month, if all goes well. Is that <laughs> on track? I guess it's not all, not quite there. So anyway, good luck. Uh, uh, Morris is no stranger to us at CEPR. He was the recipient of the Cole Hagen Fellowship last year, and three members of his thesis committee, Monica Piazzesi, Martin Schneider, and John Taylor, are CEPR senior fellows. Uh, Moritz is receiving the Landau Prize for his job market paper, which is titled Safe Assets, Collateralized Lending, and Monetary Policy. And in the paper, uh, Moritz examines how quantities of safe uh, bonds affect interest rates and asset prices, and it's a hugely important uh, question for understanding the effects of unconventional monetary policy like we have seen over the past decade. Uh, this paper is part of the CEPR working paper series, which you can easily find in our website. And it actually turned out to be a very successful uh, paper for him. Uh, consistent with that, once he graduates here with his PhD, Moritz is off to the University of Chicago, where, where he'll start off as a research fellow at the Becker Friedman Institute. And then uh, soon thereafter, he'll be continuing to head even further east when he uh, goes to Princeton University, where he'll join the economics department in 2018. So uh, Moritz, please come up here and let's have everyone give you a hand for this great honor. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you. And so here we, this is a, here we go. So put this, I don't know, above your desk or your bed or wherever. And so, uh, but congratulations. And uh, we're very proud of you and, and hope you'll keep, not forget Seeper when you head, uh, head all that way east. So congratulations again. Yeah. So again, thanks so much, everyone, for being here, to, uh, both to congratulate Moritz and also, especially, and, and also to hear from uh, Professor Lazier. So Eddie is really a founder of the field of personnel economics, and his research focuses on employee incentives, promotions, compensation, and productivity. Some of his more recent work uh, that he'll discuss today has examined issues uh, including the business cycle and entrepreneurship. Uh, Eddie has now been at Stanford for 25 years. Uh, since 1992, and really exemplifies what it means to be a bridge between the world of academia and the world of economic policy. For example, in 2006, he succeeded Ben Bernanke as the chair of President George W. Bush's Council of Economic Advisors, where he served for three years. And during that time, he focused on many important issues, including helping to lead the administration's response to the global financial crisis. Before that, he was a member of President Bush's tax reform panel, where he and nine other members looked at ways to increase the efficiency of the US tax system. He's written and taught extensively on labor market and personnel issues, and keeps a steady finger on the pulse of what's happening in Washington, DC. He's a frequent contributor to the Wall Street Journal, writing opinion pieces weighing in on economic policy. For example, a piece he wrote in February looked at what it would take for the Trump administration to hit its target of 3% growth. Uh, a combination of overhauling the tax code, encouraging investment, getting more people into the workforce, and perhaps having a bit of good luck. But I, that, uh, um, and he followed it up, some of those thoughts, just last month with another piece in the journal evaluating president, uh, the president's tax plan and concluded that those, the, these proposals would help to spur growth and raise income. Uh, when he's not putting pen to paper for the popular press, Eddie is still writing quite a lot for uh, uh, academic journals, attending seminars, advising students, and so forth. He's published well over 
100 uh, journal articles, and he's written, co-written, or edited a dozen books. Uh, in 1998, Eddie received the Melamed Prize, which cited his book, Personnel Economics, as the best research by a business school professor anywhere in the world during the previous two years. He has received the Distinguished Teaching Award from the GSB here at Stanford, as well as the PhD Faculty Distinguished Service Award. He's won the IZA Prize in Labor Economics, given to the person viewed to have made the most significant contributions to labor economics research in the entire world. He's a founding editor of the Journal of Labor Economics, and I could obviously go on and on. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and of the Econometric Society, and a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research. He is also the former president of the Society of Labor Economists. So I've taken a small fraction of the accomplishments that you can see that Eddie has amassed over the years. And if I tried to list all of them, we would I'll leave no time for him to speak. So why don't I get out of the way now? Please join me in welcoming Eddie Lazier to Seeper. Uh, to sh Thank you. Thanks, Eddie. Thanks. That's uh, unfortunate. Now you're going to be disappointed. Um, uh, what I thought I would do today, and this, this is actually a, a bit of a tough crowd because I have I, all of my nerdy economics friends in here. Uh, but I actually have some real entrepreneurs who know a lot about this area. So I have to try to speak to both of you, and I'm going to try to straddle that. Hopefully, uh, uh, I will be able to uh, interest at least each of you in, in some of the points. So uh, what I want to talk to you about today is something I've been working on on and off for about, well, about almost 15 years now, and it is this issue of entrepreneurship, and in particular, uh, what kinds of skills are associated with entrepreneurship how do you grow those skills? And then what does that imply about what we're going to see in the world uh, over time and for a number of countries in particular, some of the issues that come up uh, in China, Japan, and in the United States. So that's really where, where I want to go with this, with this talk. Um, so let me start by uh, essentially doing this chronologically, going back in time uh, to about 2003 when I was looking at my MBA students and saying, gee, you know, which ones of these students are actually going to go out and start a business that's, that's uh, effective? Um, now, I, I think I don't really have to show you this picture, but I'm just going to start with this. So this is a fit across 57 countries, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. And this is just the correlation. It's just the relationship between entrepreneurship rates and growth. And what you see, of course, is that this is a positively sloped line. It tends to, tends to uh, curve down at the end. It's concave. But the point here that I think you get at is something that I don't have to convince most of you, especially business people of, which is that uh, entrepreneurship is an engine of growth. And so when you think about that and you say, all right, well, now if I'm teaching students who are going to be aspiring entrepreneurs, and of course, Stanford Business School is a place uh, where we attract people who actually have a desire to go into business and to start businesses. Um, question is, how do we do that? So, uh, okay, go back in time, 2003, and I'm looking at these students and those who graduated, and I'm saying, okay, which ones are the ones who are most likely to have started businesses? And the answer is, it's, they're all very smart, okay? So I always brag about the Stanford business students, and, and it's accurate. They are really a very talented people. So we're talking about really the upper tail of the distribution anyway. But the question is, among them, which ones are the ones most likely to start businesses? And my intuition on this, and again, it was casual empiricism, uh, was that the ones who are technically the most able are not necessarily going to be the ones that start businesses. It tends to be the people who have a broad variety of skills. And so the idea that I had in mind was kind of the weakest link model. Uh, what, I, what I was thinking about is, suppose you want to start a restaurant, and uh, you're thinking about the skills that you need to start a restaurant. Well, first thing you need to be is a pretty good cook. If you're not a good cook, you're not going to be very successful. No one's going to like the food. They're not going to come to the restaurant. But suppose you're a great cook, but you are a terrible business person. You don't know how to source the supplies. You don't know how to deal with people. You don't know how to keep your accounts straight and so forth. That restaurant isn't going to be very successful. So the idea that I had and that I modeled uh, was essentially that your constraint is not 
your best skill, but it's actually your worst skill. It's the minimum of your skills, because that's going to limit the amount by which the business grows. Now, if you accept that story, and up to this point it is only a story, what that says is that generalists, people who have pretty broad skills, are going to be the ones who are most successful in starting the business. So this was a theory. It was a, it was a hypothesis. And let me take you to um, a picture. So suppose we have two skills here, x1 and x2. x1 might be how, how good a chef you are, and x2 might be your business acumen. Uh, then think of a dot as reflecting any point in this, in this uh, graph here is reflecting a combination of those two skills. Well, essentially what this says is that the people who are going to start businesses are those who have dots in that cone-shaped area. Whereas someone who's way, way out here, a great chef but a terrible business person, is going to end up being a specialist, going to specialize in being a cook and work for someone else. Okay? And the same at the, at the other extreme. So that's the model. That's the whole model. Uh, and, and essentially, what that says is that um, you have to have a variety of skills. So what did I do? So I got data. turns out that the um, uh, Stanford Business School collected data on, Mark, you might even know about this. You might even have been part of it. Um, I'm looking at a former dean here. And what happened was the alumni office, any, how many graduates of Stanford Business School I have here? Bob, I think this was, yeah, but this was before, uh, you were, I think you were the dean when I actually did this. You helped me do it. Um, but uh, how many graduates of the business school? MBAs. MBAs. Okay, so have a few. All right, so you guys are in my data set if you filled out the form. Um, so uh, I don't know who you are. I mean, I don't know who, I don't know anybody by name in the, in the, in the sample. But what we did was we got work histories of everybody who ever graduated from Stanford and was willing to complete the, the questionnaire. And the, the, the response rate was very high. So um, got a lot, of, a lot of good information. And what we found uh, was the following, that uh, if I take a job event, so I take an MBA who graduates, and perhaps that MBA has maybe three or four job events. So you, for example, had, I don't know what you did, but you, know, you get out. Then I look at, say, you're on job event four, and I'm reading that row that corresponds to your fourth job event. And then I ask you, were you a founder or were you an employee in that particular job event? And then I just write that down. You're a founder. All right, then what I do is I ask, how many prior roles did you have? Prior roles, not prior jobs, but prior roles. So did you do lots and lots of different things? And that's my proxy for whether you are a generalist or not, at least at the start of the study. That's my proxy for whether you're a generalist or not. Those people who had less than, let's see, we've got a pointer here, uh, less than three roles had a probability of founding a business on that particular job event of about three in 100. Whereas if you had had more than 16 roles, you had 10 times that, that probability almost 30%. So enormous difference in the probability of founding a business depending on your background. And background, in this case, being a proxy for whether you're a generalist or not. I'll show you a little bit more details uh, on the next page. Now, this is a some of these, you guys are going to go blind looking at this stuff. Um, but I had to put this up because of the nerdy guys in the audience who I'm looking at right now. Uh, and I know they're going to say, oh, well, wait a minute. You know, you got to hold stuff constant. So what this does is this holds a bunch of stuff constant. So let me, let me tell you what this says in, in English. Essentially, what this says is, well, we know job experience is going to have an effect on whether you start a business. And in fact, that's true. Most people, uh, despite their delusions of grandeur, usually are unsuccessful at a starting a business right out of business school. It usually takes a little bit of experience. You got to learn something. You usually work for someone else. And in fact, that's what this shows. So the experience matters. But the main point that you take from this table is this, is this effect, n priors, the number of prior roles you had, has a very large effect on whether you're likely to start a business. Let me give you a little bit of additional evidence. Uh, Bob helped me out on this. Uh, it turned out this was a little bit controversial, and you'll see why in a minute. Uh, so what I decided was I wanted to find out a little bit more about you MBA students, you guys that are in my sample. And so I went to the uh, administration and I said, how about telling me which courses they took and giving me their grades? Now, well, you could see why that might, um, that might get people a little bit nervous there. 
However, of course, this was redacted. I don't know who's who. I have no interest in knowing you know, which person is associated with, with grades. But what I do know here is which courses you took when you were at Stanford Business School. So if my theory is right, those people who took a more general course load, course curriculum, should be more likely to start businesses. So there's this funny thing here called spec diff, and it's, a, it's an unfortunate name. It, it sounded good at the time. But basically what it me measures is how specialized was your curriculum when you were at Stanford Business School. So some people might take four or five finance courses. Some people might take four or five marketing courses. That's pretty specialized. Others might take two in finance, two in marketing, two in human resources, two in organizational behavior, and so forth. So the ones that take 2222 two, two, have a very low value of that spec diff thing. And the ones who are specialized and take lots of finance have a very high value. And what we find is that those who are highly specialized, who take highly specialized curricula, are less likely to start a business. So again, uh, this is some corroboration of the story. I'm going to come back to this at the end of the talk and tell you how this relates to leadership in general. But this at least corroborates the, the basic idea. Uh, OK, well, now that, uh, so this was 10 years ago, and thinking about skills and the skills associated with entrepreneurship. And the basic idea, again, remember, is that you have to be a generalist. But we know that it's not necessarily easy to acquire those skills that are necessary to start a business. So the question is, how do you acquire them? How do you actually get them? Uh, and so I, I want to tell you a story about a CEPR associate uh, who was my student, my PhD student. His name is, is James Leong. And James is a, um, was actually, I didn't know anything about this guy. He was my student. At, I came back from the government. I was in the White House for three years. I came back. And I started teaching my PhD course. And there's this really smart but very quiet guy, kind of a little bit older, sitting in the, in the front row. And, and just you know, seemed like a, a terrific student. So I ended up getting to know him. And he ended up being my teaching assistant and then research assistant and then did his PhD with me and so forth. And about halfway through his PhD, I asked him, I'll tell you, this is a funny story. So I asked him, I said, James, where do you live? And he kind of says under his breath, oh, oh, I have a house in Hillsboro. And I said, house in Hillsboro? So I'm thinking, well, maybe his wife babysits for someone, and they have a little house out in the back. And so it turns out Nick blooms. Nick, Nick's not here. Well, Nick knows everything. So you know, Nick sort of keeps in touch with everything that's happening. One day, Nick says, oh, you know, James is the founder of this huge company in China. And you know, he's worth a zillion dollars, OK? And so uh, it turns out James had founded a company called C-Trip, which is now the largest travel agency in, in China. It also owns uh, about 2,000 hotels in China. Um, and uh, yeah, he's a pretty entrepreneurial guy. Um, and so the question is, you know, how did James get into this position? How did he get there? And here's the answer. The answer is the motivation for the next paper, uh, which is one that's forthcoming in the JP. And I'll tell you a little bit about it in a minute. But the, mo but the story is essentially this. What happened was, you know, James was a very bright guy. So he was a, a wunderkind, went to Fudan University at 14 and so forth, had all that good stuff going for him. But he had one other thing going for him, and that is he came back to Silicon Valley at exactly the right time. And what he ended up doing was becoming the vice president of consulting for Oracle by the time he was 28 years old. Now, that story is not unusual. If you think about Silicon Valley, it's dominated by very young people who move up and get the advantage of being in a high position where they get lots and lots of experience that then helps them found their own business. So he goes back to China, found C-Trip, uh, and that's the basic story. Same story is repeated by the people who work for him at C-Trip. So then he's got lots of young people working for him. They go off and start businesses and so forth, all right? So the idea that we came up with for this paper was essentially that um, youth uh, is important for two reasons. One, young people might have energy and creativity and willingness to take risk, whatever. All of those things that we might associate with, with youth. But more important, when you're in a young society like Silicon Valley, which is a young society, you get the opportunity to do the kinds of jobs that provide you with the skills necessary to become an entrepreneur. 
And so if you're young, you might have a lot of energy, but the problem is you don't know anything. So in order to get those kinds of skills, to get the kind of background, you have to be in a situation where you actually can uh, have a high level job and acquire those skills. So what we did was we looked at countries um, around the world. And what we found is that they varied tremendously in their rates of entrepreneurship. So for example, Japan is, a, is an old society, and it has very low rates of entrepreneurship. And at the other extreme, the youngest country in the world is Uganda. Uh, and it has very high rates of entrepreneurship. And that correlation, as I'll show you in a minute, is actually quite strong. But it's more than that. What is also true is that at every age level, those countries that are young have higher rates of entrepreneurship. So, for example, if I compare Japan to Korea, Korea is aging now, but it's still a much younger country than is Japan. And if I compare 30-year-olds in Korea and compare them to 30-year-olds in Japan, what I find is 30-year-olds in Korea are going to be more entrepreneurial than 30-year-olds in Japan. And that's true for 50-year-olds in Korea and 50-year-olds in Japan. And it's true at every age. And the question is why. And so we argue that the reason is that if you're in a young society, you're more likely to be in a managerial position where you get those opportunities to actually learn the kinds of things that are necessary to become an entrepreneur. Okay, So that's the basic story. So um, let, me, let, let me just cut to the chase here. Uh, as I said, we were motivated by this uh, uh, by looking, actually we started by looking at Japan. And we said, you know, Japan is a funny case because if you think about Japan, I don't know if you remember, but most of the people in this room are actually, I, as I look around, most of you look old enough to remember this. But in the 80s, we were all worried that Japan was going to take over the world because Japan was an extremely entrepreneurial place, lots of new business creation, lots of new ideas, lots of growing entrepreneurship. And then if you look at it right now, it's completely different. So over time, Japan's entrepreneurship rate has fallen and fallen dramatically. And that's also associated with the aging of the Japanese uh, uh, society, of that age distribution. It's changed over time. So that's the basic story. So let me, let me show you a picture that essentially summarizes this paper. As I said, this is a forthcoming paper in the JPE, Journal of Political Economy. Um, but uh, there's, a, there's a theory, and the theory has seven propositions, and every one of them is borne out by the data. Uh, but what I want to do is, without giving you the technical details of this stuff, I can basically tell you the whole story just by showing you this one picture. So implication one is the one that I just gave you, which is younger countries have higher average entrepreneurship rates, and more than that, they have higher entrepreneurship rates at any given age. That's implication one. Implication two is that the relationship of entre entrepreneurship to age is an inverted U, and I'll tell you why that is in a, in a second. And then that the inverted U is most pronounced among the young countries. That's a little bit more subtle, but I'll tell you why that's true in a second. So what does this picture do? It takes data from a survey called the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor, which surveys people uh, about uh, 1.3 million uh, across the world, 82 different countries, and it gets the rates of entrepreneurship at each different age level and, and so forth, okay? And so what we did, um, we did a lot of stuff that's a lot more formal than this, but basically this picture just gives you the whole summary of it, and it says, let's split those countries into three groups, old countries, middle-aged countries, and young countries, old, middle-aged, and young. Okay, and let's look at their entrepreneurship rates. Well, what you see is that the entrepreneurship rates of the young countries are high, of the old countries are low, and of the middle-aged countries are middle. But more important, these lines never cross. And what that says, the fact that these lines never cross, tells you that this relationship holds at every single age. In other words, if you look at 40-year-olds, 40-year-olds are, are more entrepreneurial in the old countries than the middle-aged countries, than the young, uh, sorry, young countries than the middle-aged countries than the old countries. Same is true of 30-year-olds, same is true of 50-year-olds, same is true of 60-year-olds. And most of the variation in these rates 
is not because of different composition. It's not because young countries have more young people. It's mostly because at any given age, within that group, people who live in young countries are more entrepreneurial. Again, this is a Silicon Valley story. This is essentially the idea that if you're in Silicon Valley, everybody is young because only young people have the skills to do those businesses. And as a result, they're the ones who acquire the skills to go out and start these businesses later on. Okay, so that's the basic story. Now, here's a picture of this across the 82 countries. And so if you did, forget about this one. I, this is a little bit more technical, and I can basically explain it to you here. If you just look at the median age of the country, and you plot that against the entrepreneurship rate, what you see is that line. that You could draw a negatively sloped line to it. It looks pretty clear. Now, we may not want to compare, oops, sorry, we may not want to compare uh, Uganda to Finland or Belgium or even Italy. Okay, those are different levels of development. So what this one does is it does the same thing, but it does it only for OECD countries. So we're at least looking at, at somewhat uh, more similar kinds of countries. Same basic idea, not quite a strong result, but still the same basic result. Okay. What this stuff does, and again, I, I know that you, you see all these numbers, your eyes glaze over. Let me tell you what this means in English. So the first time anybody says this is, well, maybe there's a bunch of other stuff going on in a country that's associated with age. For example, you know, who wants to invest in Japan? It's a moribund country right now. It's got nothing to do with the age distribution. It's just nothing's going on there. Maybe that's correlated with this stuff. So what we do here is we hold a bunch of other things constant. And to summarize it, um, those other things like the growth rate of the country, its stage of development, whether it has a lot of people in agriculture, none of those things matter except for one. And here's this one's kind of interesting, and it's consistent with the theory. So when I gave this paper, I gave it around the world. I gave it in Switzerland, and I gave it in Germany, and I gave it in Israel. Turns out both in Switzerland and Israel, do you know what they have in common? What do they have in common? Very good. Mandatory military. They both have a draft. OK, you got to go into the military. And so I remember when I was giving a seminar, I don't remember whether it was in Switzerland. No, it was in Israel. Um, one, of the, one of the people in the audience said, well, you know, if your story's right, then countries that have military should be more entrepreneurial. Because in the military, you're taking young people and you're putting them in positions of responsibility at very young ages and giving, those, giving them the same kinds of skills. So I said, oh, that's a good idea. I'll try it. Turns out, if you look at this, military service is the only factor other than uh, the one that I'm talking about that actually matters. And it is very strong. So their conjecture was actually right. So it does seem to go the right way. OK, let me, uh, let me jump ahead and uh, summarize the last paper, the one that's current. One of the problems, while we like this story and we believe it, we think it's true, and so did JPE, fortunately, um, it's not the best evidence on it because it's kind of a macro aggregate overview. What you'd really like to see is the Silicon Valley story. You'd really like to test that directly. So what you'd like to see is if someone is accidentally thrust into a managerial position, does that eventually create the kinds of skills that allow them to start businesses later on. Okay? So uh, it turns out, and people, the academics in this room probably know this, but it turns out that the Danes have among the best uh, data, set, data in the world for analyzing this kind of thing, because you can look at individuals in the entire country in every single firm. So you can look at a firm and you can say, well, if this is a firm where, for some reason, they had high growth, for example, or uh, all the senior guys retired, and so the young guys, for some reason, ended up being thrust accidentally into these managerial positions, does that then translate later into them being more likely to start a business? So that's what we do in the Danish data. And in a nutshell, the answer is yes. If you are in a firm, that has a high proportion of young people in managerial positions, then you as an individual are more likely to end up starting a business. And it's certainly true that if you were in a managerial position, you're more likely to start a business. But that's not a clean test, because those people who end up being in a managerial position may also uh, have the same entrepreneurial skills. So that seems to work. 
One last point on this, and then I'm going to return to the policy implications and then give it back to you. Um, one last point. So, uh, got a few women in here. I see Pascaline and, and Lori. And, and, uh, uh, so, let, let me talk about. So, here's what happened. Um, in Denmark, if you go back 25 years ago, very few women in, in management. Uh, true in the United States as well, but it was more, even more true in, in Denmark. Over time, that's changed. Uh, Norway had an explicit policy of putting women on boards. Uh, the Danes wasn't quite as explicit, but you see it in the data. Much more likely that women are going to be in managerial positions. Now, what that means is that if you have a limited number of managerial positions, if women are more likely to be in managerial positions, that means men are less likely to be in managerial positions. So this is, in some sense, an exogenous factor. The, the, the desire by the Danes to allow more women to move into management essentially pushed men out of the management positions in kind of an exogenous way. That's the kind of stuff that economists like. They like these things that are beyond the control of people who are actually uh, in those positions because it's a clean test. And what we see is, in fact, what you would expect. And that is that as more women end up in managerial positions, the entrepreneurship rate among women actually goes up. And it goes up quite significantly. But those poor men that are being crowded out, their entrepreneurship rates go down. Okay? And that's what, that's what we find. And, so, and that's a pretty big effect, actually. So again, more evidence uh, to support the claim that um, uh, these kinds of skills that are being actually created by learning on the job, by being in those positions, are important. And they do seem to have a, a pretty big effect. Now, um, what, what are the, what are the let, me, let me move to leadership. And then I'm going to come back and talk a little bit about policy. So uh, I want to go back to my Stanford data. Uh, many of you are not entrepreneurs per se in the sense that you didn't necessarily create the firm, you weren't the founder of the firm, but you still think of yourselves as entrepreneurial. You're important managers of the firm, maybe the CEO, so forth. So if you take a guy like Jack Welch, for example, you know, he wasn't the founder of GE. Uh, that was Thomas Edison, right? But um, he probably thinks of himself as having been an entrepreneur and kind of reinventing that company and so forth. And there are plenty of you who are like that. So, one would think that if this theory about being general, having general skills, applies to entrepreneurship, it also ought to apply to being a leader, being a high-level position in the firm. That's, that would be the argument. And uh, so uh, what we find, and in fact it, what tends to be true, is that those individuals who have general skills, again as, as measured by my previous stuff, either lots of different roles, or they took a general curriculum when they were at Stanford, are more likely to be in the C-level positions. C-level meaning CEO, CIO, COO, uh, CTO, uh, or a managing director. They're the ones more likely to be there. Uh, so again, this general skills story seems to work not only for entrepreneurs, but also for CEOs. Now, remember I told you that I, because of Bob, I actually know which courses these people took. So I couldn't resist. Uh, I had to see what economics does. Um, and turns out, fortunately, uh, that the course that is most correlated, most highly correlated with becoming a C-level person in the firm is economics. So, and finance is negative. Finance is actually negative. Okay. Now, that doesn't say that economics makes you rich. In fact, it's the opposite. So economics has zero effect on income. Even though you're more likely to become a C-level person, it doesn't have any effect on income. But finance has a huge effect on income. Okay? So these guys don't become C-level people, but they do become very rich. Uh, and so that's, that's what shows up in the data. I have a story. I'll give you my conjecture. I don't know if it's true, but I'll give you my conjecture. My conjecture is this. When I think about what does economics teach you to do, answer is nothing. Okay. Um, <laughs> So if you learn economics and you basically say, you know, what can I do? What can I sell now that, I'm a, now that I've studied economics? The answer is, well, you know, I'm, I'm a smart guy and I know how to think about the world, but I don't really have a skill. Whereas if I take finance or if I take accounting, like Mark, 
you know, then I really have something to sell. There's something actually that's tangible and valuable. So the argument that I would make, and again, I have no evidence to support this, but it is consistent with this view, is that essentially what economics teaches you to do is it teaches you to think about problems in a concise, parsimonious way, get to the answer uh, in, a, in a clean way, and that's basically what you have to do as a leader. But, but that's not a skill that you can use unless you get pretty high up into the firm's hierarchy. And so that's a, that's a conjecture. It's consistent with the data. Uh, there's no proof of that. All right. Let me conclude by talking policy for just two minutes here, and then I'm going to let Mark, Mark wants about 20 minutes or so. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, let me just conclude by two things on policy. Uh, so I, I mentioned Germany. I actually spend a lot of time in, in Europe and in German-speaking countries. Uh, and uh, those of you who know Germany uh, know that in German-speaking countries, one of the things that they're very good at is vocational training. And that's great. And it is true that that has some, some very positive aspects to it because it means that the people who don't go on to college actually have skills that, that they can sell, that make them productive. Um, the bad thing about it is those skills tend to be pretty narrow. And so what this implies is that if you are if you have an educational system that looks like the German educational system, you may have a productive labor force, but you don't have as much entrepreneurship as you have in the United States. And that's true. As an empirical statement, that is actually true. Okay? Now, whether that's the reason for it, I can't prove, but it certainly goes that way. So what that says is that if we go in the direction of vocational training, and I'd actually like to see us do a bit more of that for a variety of reasons, um, one of the things that we have to be careful about is we may lose some of the general kinds of skills uh, that are valuable in terms of starting businesses. The other policy implication that's important, I mentioned James earlier. Um, uh, James, uh, I'm going to tell you another one minute story about James. So I was mad at James. I got angry at him a little bit because uh, after he finished his PhD, I wanted to hood him at graduation. Okay, you know, it's, it, you work with a guy for a couple of years, you know, it's like you want the honor of being able to put the hood on him at his PhD graduation. The guy didn't show up. And I said, you know, why aren't you coming? He said, well, because, you know, we have this, we have this big conference in China and everybody's coming and it's on the one child policy and I really feel like I have to go. Okay, so I said, ah, come to your graduation. No, he went to the one child. Well, it turns out, uh, among the many things that James did when he was a PhD student, he produced on the side a video uh, arguing against the one-child policy for exactly the reason that I was talking about earlier, which is if you have a one-child policy, that creates an old society. If you have an old society, what's that going to do to entrepreneurship? It's going to kill it off. So he's worried that if you go in that direction of enforcing the one-child policy, all the dynamism that you see in China right now is going to disappear over time. That's, that's the concern. Well, it turns out, you know, I thought, I literally was worried about James' safety. I mean, I'm not kidding. I actually said, I thought, because the Chinese government would not allow the video to be played on TV. He put it on the internet, and it was basically smuggled in. And I thought, you know, this is crazy, James. You, you know, you're nuts. It turned out James was not nuts. James became the strongest advocate of the one-child policy in China. And as you may know, a couple of years ago, they changed the one-child policy. So the government actually turned around on this and did relax the one-child policy. So again, if you think about these demographics as being important in determining the long-term uh, growth of an economy, this tells you not only about organic growth, like a one-child policy, but it also has implications for immigration. Uh, so let me let me stop there and uh, and turn it over to Mark. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'm just going to ask a, two or three questions and then open it up to our audience okay. uh, who know a lot more about entrepreneurship than I do. Uh, but so one thing that I've noticed over the last mm. six or seven months since November eighth is that there's been a big increase in optimism among small business, mm -hmm. small businesses especially. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on what factors are responsible for that and if that optimism is well-founded given the policies changes that might be coming down the pike. Okay, good. All right. So um, 
the, you know, the issue with sp small businesses, of course, is you know, when I talked about entrepreneurship and starting businesses, uh, there are a number of factors that come into play. What I was emphasizing today was the human capital factors, the right. skill side of it. But there are other factors, and the other factors are really on, on the government side, and that would be things like tax policy and regulation. So you mentioned earlier an, um, an op-ed that I did in the Wall Street Journal. So let me just answer you by kind of repeating the, the main point in there. So uh, uh, I, I actually visited the, uh, the White House about four or five weeks ago and, and met with the economics team and briefed them on a couple of labor issues and a couple of other things. Um, and, uh, you know, these guys are, are regular. The, the economics team is, is um, Mnuchin, Cohn, uh, Mulvaney from OMB, uh, Pence, vice president, is there, was there uh, as well. And they're thinking about things in the way that, you know, what I would say traditional Republicans think about things. Namely, that in order to get growth, what you have to do is two things. One is you have to remove impediments to capital investment. So we know if we look at, the, if we look at this particular recovery, we know that CapEx has been pretty low in this particular recovery. Uh, and the second thing they would, you know, traditional Republicans would argue is you've got to be very careful about regulation. Careful meaning adopt a cost-benefit approach. In other words, n this doesn't say no regulation, but it says regulation only when the benefits of the regulation exceeds the cost. So I guess the, the way I would, I would put it is I, I think these guys are, are pretty tuned into that. Uh, my sense is that's the way they're actually thinking about the world. Um, the main thing they're doing, and, and again, if you come back to the plan that they put out, it was, it was very short, but it wasn't, it wasn't empty. It actually had some specifics that allowed you to at least get a sense of what that would do. In particular, what they were talking about was reducing taxation on capital by about half of what it is right now. And when, um, when I was in the government, we actually scored that and said, what would... Uh, eliminating taxation on capital do. Our estimate was somewhere between 4 to 5 percent of GDP uh, increase. And uh, if you look back in the literature, if you go back to the um, stuff that Alan Auerbach and others have written, their estimates are as high as 9 percent. So uh, pretty big effects of uh, reducing taxation on capital if you believe the estimates in the literature. So, so that would be a positive. And do you think that is likely to happen in the coming months? Well, look, everybody wants, everybody claims they want to reduce taxes on capital. So, you know, even if you go back to the Obama administration, remember President Obama was talking about reducing tax, uh, corporate taxes as well. So in some sense, that's a bipartisan issue. Uh, I think what you're getting at, Mark, and you, you know, you said it with a smile, and I think the reason you said it with a smile is that it's, that what you think of as a good way to reduce capital taxation and what I think of as a good way to reduce ta capital taxation may be different. And it may be different even within the Republican Congress, the Senate and the House. Right. And it's certainly different uh, uh, with respect to what the White House is thinking. So at least my experience in government, and I had now you know, three years there, is that it's very difficult for Congress to do anything on its own. It really does take the leadership of the White House to do it. It's the executive branch that essentially sets the path, and then Congress you know, tweaks it and follows it, but the executive branch really has to do it. So unless the president um, and, his, and his, you know, his team can get it together and really push things along, it, it's going to be a, a, a real tough battle. Right. Um, so you talked about entrepreneurship. Earlier this week, we, uh, we pushed out a research article uh, by some CEPR scholars, Chad Jones, Nick yep. Bloom, one of our PhD students, Mike Webb, and John Van Rienen, yep. talking about how it's becoming harder and harder to push forward sort of the frontiers yep. of knowledge. I guess that's true maybe in economics too, I don't know. But in, in, uh, in, uh, as an entrepreneur, coming up with this sort of uh, these, these big ideas is getting tougher and tougher. And they have various ways of trying to think about how the productivity of R&D is evolving over time. And at some level, the, the, the numbers that came out of that study were a little bit troubling because it suggested we, it's, it, it's been falling, the R&D productivity has been falling, and, and, it's, and the trend isn't great either. Um, and so I'm just curious to hear your thoughts. When we talk about entrepreneurship, there's you know, starting a company, but then there's also what are the companies that really make a difference, that make, uh, uh, the hum you know, make people better off? Okay. All right. So let me, let me answer it in a couple of ways. So um, the, the, uh, the um, 
study that you're talking about by uh, Chad et al. Uh, I, I think one of the things they emphasize is that it takes a lot more people to get you the same number of ideas. Um, now, the other thing they point out is that we have more people going into the idea creation business, not necessarily in the United States. In fact, they argue that you know, the ideas may be coming from China because they have so many more people right. you know, going into this stuff because they have so many more people, period. Um, so that's, that's one thing. But I think if we think about it from the point of view of the US, uh, essentially, you know, as you know, Bob, where's Bob? Bob's right there. Um, uh, has uh, studied this for the, the past few years now and uh, detailed it, it pretty carefully. Uh, and that is, we, we know that there's been a productivity slowdown, a significant productivity slowdown over time. And the question is, what's caused that productivity slowdown and can that be reversed? Uh, because without that, you're really not going to get this, this thing going again. So the tax stuff is, is one side of it. That helps. Uh, the question is whether it's sufficient. So, you know, to go from 1% productivity growth back up to some number like 2 to 2.5% two productivity growth is a tall order. Uh, and so, you know, the issue is can we get there with tax and regulatory policy? I think most people think probably not. Uh, so, in the long run, basically, the only way to do it is human capital. And that's the theme that we should be pushing because. First of all, that's what we sell, is human capital. So you always want to talk your own book. So you know, for those of you who are in the audience not associated uh, with the Stanford Economics Department or the Stanford Business School, we're doing good stuff for society uh, by, <laughs> by producing human capital. But, but it's true, actually. I think in the long run, that's essentially what does it. And that is consistent with the, with the Chad et al. piece, because what they are saying is you need more idea generation. And the idea generation comes primarily from having more human capital. The last thing that you'd focus on would be hours, hours of work. We know that the demographics, um, and I'm looking at a few of us in the audience here, myself included, uh, the demographics are working against us because as, since we're an aging population, we do have a smaller and smaller fraction of the country that's going to be working in the future. And unless, as another CEPR, uh, your predecessor has been pushing, unless we get people to work longer, stay in the workforce for a longer period of time, uh, that's going to be a big issue. OK, uh, one last question before I open it up. Sure. We've heard a lot about health care policy, tax policy. We're going to hear more about infrastructure now, it seems like, in the next uh, week, two weeks, month, what have you. Um, but one thing that ha is sort of out there, and I, I want to ask this because there was a new study released by AEI and Brookings today, a jointly sort of authored study between sort of people on both sides of the political aisle. And you being an expert on labor markets, I'm curious to hear your take on it. Uh, uh, paid family leave. So this is something that Ivanka Trump has really p pushed hard. And the president has also uh, in indicated some support for. And it's a possible policy that we could see in the coming months, in addition to all this stuff that we've heard a lot about. And I'm curious to hear what your thoughts would be about whether that would have big labor market effects. Some people point to the US in this area being different from other countries in a, in a not great way, that we, do, we don't have it, but maybe we shouldn't have it. So your thoughts on this. OK. Well, um, I guess I, I, I would give you the standard economist answer on the one hand, on the other Yeah, hand. sure. Let me give you on the one hand first. Mm. Um, on the one hand, our demographic situation is not as bad as the demographic situation of other developed countries. So for example, if you compare us to Italy or Japan, as we were talking about earlier, uh, our demographics are a lot better. We're, not, we're, no, we're nowhere near as old a society as they are, and we're not aging as quickly. So the problem that we face with an aging population is not as pronounced in the United States as it is elsewhere. Um, that said, uh, we are still aging. And we know that these policies uh, work. And what I mean when I say we know that they work, what I mean is that if you look cross-sectionally, if you look at Europe, compare Sweden to Germany, for example. Sweden has a very generous uh, family leave policy. They encourage people, not only the women, but they encourage the men uh, with some penalties associated with not actually taking your, your family leave uh, when your child is born. Uh, they pay a lot for that. They subsidize child care. Uh, so they go way out of their way. Now, that creates some market inefficiencies, as we all know. 
but it def definitely does have effect on demographics. So if you look at the birth rates in Sweden, uh, and even the native-born Sweden population, they have a very high immigration, immigrant population, but even if you look at the native-born Swedish population, it's significantly higher than the German population or than the Italian. And so, again, if you just do the cross-sectional comparison, those countries that have generous childcare policies versus those that don't, uh, you do tend to see a demographic effect. Now, again, if you go back to what I was talking about a uh, half hour ago and you say, well, wh why do we care about that? Why do we want more kids? Well, in addition to the fiscal issues that we always associate with this, there is also this um, factor of creating a young society for business formation. Right. Okay. Great. Okay, so I'm going to take questions now from the audience. Uh, David. Eddie, that was great. Um, Thank you. I'm an entrepreneur for over 30 years, and, and what you're saying kind of makes sense to me, but here's my question. What is your definition of being an entrepreneur? And a little bit on Mark's Good. question about successful entrepreneurs, because what, what I was thinking about the whole time is the difference between an entrepreneur and a successful entrepreneur is a generalist who actually knows what he's not good at. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. So um, uh, two answers uh, to your question. First of all, the first answer is that um, when, I, when I think about what a successful entrepreneur is, the way I measure that actually in my study, and this is kind of a technical detail, um, is I, I don't have data on how well the business did, but what I do have is how, how much it grew over time. So I can look at the rate of employee growth. I know when you started the business, how many employees were in it? Three. And then you know, when you left the business, how many were in it? And so I can at least measure that factor. That does seem to be associated with these general skills. Okay? So um, you know, I don't know whether that supports your, your experience or not, but that does seem to be the case. Uh, as far as the definition, let me turn to the other study, the one where we compare countries around the world. Remember, most businesses are not what we think of in Silicon Valley. Businesses that we think of in Silicon Valley are, you know, Google and Facebook and all these cool places uh, where our students want to work. Most businesses in the world are, you know, dry cleaners in a strip mall, okay? And so, or, or even worse, you know, if you're in Uganda, you're talking about someone who set up a little stand by the side of the road and is selling fruits and vegetables. Uh, those people are counted as businesses in the study as long as they pay wages to others. So the way the study does it is they say, okay, have you been in business for 42 months or less? Because I have to know it's a new business. I want to know what your age is when you started it. Uh, and then they say, do you pay your workers? Do you have workers that you actually pay? So if you're, for example, if you're a self-employed cleaning person, you wouldn't show up as a business in these data. Now, those businesses are useful and they're important, and most businesses are of that kind, but they're probably not the kinds of businesses that we think of as being essential to grow the economy. You know, you'd want to see, in addition to that stuff, certainly some complementary larger businesses that are pushing the frontier forward. Uh, and, and for those businesses, again, I would, I would say most of, these, most of these issues have to do with human capital. So, uh, let me just give you one, one piece of data on this, and then I'll, I'll stop. Uh, if you, you know, we always think of foreign direct investment as being really important, right? Well, it turns out foreign direct investment is trivial in terms of its impact on economic growth. So if I look at the Asian tigers, for example, I look at Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, Korea, the one that had the most FDI was Singapore. It was 10% of total capital. Hong Kong was 5%. Taiwan was 1%, Korea was 1%. So basically, most capital comes from the inside. But what foreign direct investment does is it doesn't bring in a lot of physical capital, but it does bring in human capital. And so, again, if you look at a country like China, early in China's development, they brought in a lot of businesses from outside, and it wasn't that they were contributing a whole lot to the physical capital stock, but the Chinese were learning from the outsiders. They were learning from guys like you, and that was probably the most important ingredient in terms of generating businesses. And then, you know, in the, uh, over time, they, they have less and less need for it because they can produce it internally. But at least initially, that was a, that was a big deal. So, yeah. Question over there. So I'd like, I think the talk was great, but I'd like to ask about the outliers. Sure, um, yeah. You know, Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg, um, 
you know, our those businesses have, I was trying to do it in my head, somewhere between 10,000 and 100,000 times the effect of the average entrepreneur. Yeah. What, and they're narrowly focused uh, guys, what have you learned about having more of them? Okay, so I, I guess I would, I would push back on you when you say they're narrowly focused guys. They're in narrowly focused businesses, but they're not narrowly focused guys. So if you, think of the, if you think of the people, even in Silicon Valley, and even a technical business like Apple Computers, because it was computers before it was iPods and iPads and so forth, um, you know, Jobs was an amazingly general guy in terms of he could do everything. I mean, he had skills. He had communication skills. He had management skills. He, had, he understood enough about the engineering, and he had Wozniak on the side to kind of help him with that. But I would argue that he is, in, in some sense, the poster child for what I'm, what I'm talking about, which is here's a guy who had, a, had just a, a, skills all over the place that allowed that business to grow. If you think of our local boys, Hewlett and Packard, you know, we think of them as technical engineers, but they weren't just technical engineers. They were technical engineers, but these were also guys who had terrific communication skills and business skills and so forth. And so I would argue that most of the people in this room, most of you, who are successful are exactly those people, that you know something, you had one technical thing that you knew about, but it was the complementary skills along with that that made your businesses successful. If you were only a nerdy technical guy, like some of us in this room, um, we wouldn't be able to do the same kinds of things that you could do. Zuckerberg, who was a technical guy, but again, think of, you know, think of the general skills that that guy had in terms of business sense and communication and the ability to put people together and to motivate workers. You know, not many people who are technical like him have that set of skills. So I would actually argue that, that your examples are, in some sense, consistent with this theory. And you're right. Those are the guys that are driving, you know, they're driving the progress. So those are the ones that we want to produce. Um, you got to know something technical that's really good, but you also have to be able to complement that with these other things as well. That, that would be my, my answer to Daniel. Yeah, back here. Oh, um, excuse me. Uh, I was wondering if uh, you looked at data for either different U.S. states or metropolitan areas, because in that case, you have the same national tax policies and other yeah. policies. So, so to what extent does this theory apply within a country? And also, if you want to comment, if you had the simpler uh, data for a country like Germany or others, and how well that process works even though people, young people can move from one part of the country to another. Well, that's, that's the problem. Okay, so that, you just kind of gave, you gave my answer for me. Okay, so no, no, it's a good answer. It's actually the reason. So after we did this uh, paper that's coming out in the, in the journal, we thought, well, the next thing we ought to do is exactly what you said. Do it within the country uh, and do it locally. Uh, the problem with that, you know, as a test of the theory, essentially saying, you know, some areas have young populations, some areas have old populations, some areas have young businesses and so forth. The problem with that is, is was your last line, and that is there's just too much mobility in the United States. So um, my research assistant is sitting here. We just put together a chart for a, another talk that I gave on a completely different topic. But it turns out that in the United States, 16% uh, of the population moves every year. If you, look at the, if you look at Europe, it's 7%. So we're a very mobile society relative to the Europeans. And as a result of that, if Silicon Valley is growing, what you're going to do is you're going to attract people from, like Zuckerberg, where is that? He didn't grow up in Silicon Valley. He's probably from, he's a New York guy, isn't he? Or something? Yeah. East Coast. So a lot of mobility. Go ahead. You're going to follow, though, with something. If, if you're saying people move 16% a year, but you know, if a person moves from San Jose to San Francisco, yeah. they're in the same metropolitan area. That's right. So the question and is, what to, what, to what extent do they move far away to a different yeah. universe, so okay. to speak? Yeah. No, that's exactly right. And in fact, you're, you, so all we know is that they move. We don't know where they move. And most of the mobility is going to be local. But the point is that most of the mobility in Europe is also going to be local, and even more so probably. And so the point is that even if three quarters of it is local, the, point, the fact that people are more likely to move in the U.S. than they are in other countries uh, in some ways w w causes, uh, as a, just as, a, as, a, as a, an, a design for an experiment, 
it causes me problems because I can't sort of say this is an isolated, non-competitive community with other communities. And that's, that's why we actually went to the Danish data, because we said, well, there, what we can do is we can actually observe what's going on in this particular firm. We can see what your experience was in this particular firm. We can figure out whether you got into that job as a result of something that was external. It just seemed like a cleaner test. But we were with you, actually. So I don't, I don't want to push back too hard, because that was actually, was, we were thinking that would be our next step. We may actually go back and try to do something along those lines. Okay, we got one more question. Pascaline. Thank you. Pascaline. Thank you very much. Um, another way to fight off aging as a country, to keep entrepreneurship going, um, besides encouraging fraternity, is to let a whole bunch of young people in. Yeah. So given that, um, is that something you shared with the White House a few weeks ago? Uh, is there a way? Um, okay, so um, you're, uh, the an let, me, let me answer you two ways. First of all, I'm a big fan of immigration as a way to do this. Um, it turns out it's pretty slow. Uh, it's helpful. It certainly goes in the right direction. It's pretty slow. It's hard to change the demographics of a country the size of the United States by immigration. So we let in about a million people per year. You were one of them, obviously. Um, and, uh, uh, but if you have 330 million, the age of immigrants is younger than the age of the population as a whole. It's not that much younger. So if you look at the age of green card holders, it's about five years younger than the average age of the native borns, OK? So what that means is that if you only have a million of those coming in and you got 329 million of the others, um, it's going to be pretty hard to move the needle. It certainly goes in the right direction. Now, you've previewed the talk that I'll give at CEPR in the future. I'm currently working on a paper on exactly this topic which is how does our immigration policy affect the attainment of immigrants in the United States and what they end up doing? Um, answer is, I did not talk about that with these guys. I talk, we were talking about other stuff. We were talking about labor markets, China actually, and tax policy primarily. Uh, but um, uh, I'm, you know, I, I, have, I have access to those guys, I think. And so after I finish this paper, I'm actually going to call them up and say, hey, I got something for you. But uh, you know, there's mixed feelings within that administration on immigration. So, so some are, you know, it, it, but there, it really is mixed. No, it really is mixed. So you have some pro-immigration people in there, and you have some very anti-immigration people in there. So anyway. Okay, well, with that, please join me in thanking Eddie Lizard.